G'day Legends, I hope that you've all had a great weekend. I had a couple of days off to spend some time with the family interstate. So we're going to look over a few things that have happened in the past couple of days, as I'm a few days behind. So what we're going to talk about is a huge explosion in the west of Ukraine, new missiles being used against Russia and what this could mean, and some news updates. But as always, we're going to begin with a look at the maps. And as always, this is where we start. Zoomed right out, we have Ukraine in the center and the capital of Kiev. We have the red areas, areas occupied since 22, and the purple since 14, the green of which has been liberated since the invasion in 22. Now here We've got Romania, Poland, Belarus, and Russia around here. Now, we haven't seen that many huge map updates in the past couple of days, but what we have seen is a lot of movement in around here in Bakhmut, which is somewhere we talk about a lot. Now, Prigozhin only today has said that units of Wagner have advanced up to 220 metres, occupied an area of 5,000 square metres under enemy control, this being 1.59 square kilometres. PMC Wagner continues the attack on Bakhmut, that there are 36 houses under control and 12 high-rise buildings under enemy control. Control. So let's have a look at this. So I believe the last time I spoke to you was maybe the 12th or the 13th. So let's just roll back a couple of days and what are we seeing? We're just going to zoom out here. Now remember that the red area is area that is being held by Russia, the blue is by Ukraine, and of course the green areas that have been re-liberated. So, and then we have the grey zone of course as well. So we roll forward that we do see here more area taken by the Ukrainians up north of this road of life through Kromove here. We also have some more movement on the south as well, and as we come forward days, we see more of this territory being cleared and then coming under not only grey area but then control being by the blue and then further and we have more area being controlled by the Ukrainian forces but we have seen major shifts around Bakhmut as Ukraine gets more control of the north and south flanks of Bakhmut. Now what about right in the centre? Now in the centre is where we have seen no changes from the Ukrainian side but we have seen that the Russian Wagner group has got more area under control down here and as we see that this spike has come out through this is the road we always talk about that loops around sort of with one through it that has come under more control there right in the center of Bakhmut. And what does the ISW show? The ISW is showing fairly similar to this right in the center, but only assessed control right up through to this road and the one through the middle where it loops around, which is indicated right by this spire here as well. But if we zoom out on the ISW, we see these areas that have been cleared by the Ukrainian forces on the north and south flanks of Bakhmut, indicated as well by where we see chop in and chop in as here and up here as well. So there has been a lot of fluid movements on the front line around Bakhmut. Now, what are the other maps showing? So what are the maps from the Russian sources showing against these? So let's have a look at War Mapper, which is a Ukrainian source map here. And this is, I believe, the 12th and the 16th. So the last time I spoke to you versus today. Now, we have seen more clearance from this road through Kromove, this road of life, we have seen Ukraine push the Russians further back here. But in the center, like we spoke about, that on the 16th, we have seen Russia take more ground through the center down here. And this is indicating very, very similar to what we see on the deep state map. So let's have a look then on the Rybar Russian sources. And this is showing sort of similar to the deep state where they're showing they're coming down this main road here. This is very zoomed in, but it is showing somewhat similar, if not a little bit less on that one. And then we'll have a look at the Rybar Russian sources as well. Of course, we'll have the newer Rybar being the 14th, which is still, I know, for hours 48 hours old on the right and the 12th, which is the one I spoke to you last time on the left. So what major shifts do we see? We do see that this has somewhat stabilized through here of where we did see that Ukrainian forces did push the Russians a significant way back up to this reservoir here, as we know that this is a fluid front line. And in the center, we see that Wagner has made more gains in and around the center. And on the south, it has had a major chunk again, which we see on the 12th, this knob out here has been cleared in through this position. You can see the dark blue here. Now, 
we also have the Wagner sources map. The left is from the 12th last time I spoke to you, and this one on the right is from the 14th, so 24, 48 hours old, depending where you are in the world, depending when this was put up. But we see this clearance from the Ukrainian side along this knob that I talked about before, and more clearances up around here through the north of the Road of Life, through Kromove, and the same just to the north west as well now i actually have this map translated here as well and what are they saying the translated version lost units of the 200th motorized rifle brigade to the russian armed forces here now remember that these are very on the pro-russian side like you could have a wagner situation back boot update here lost units of the fourth motorized brigade of the russian armed forces uh, by the May. So these are positions that have been lost. So the Russian armed forces in these positions have lost these positions that they're saying, like this lost units of the 72nd Motorized Rifle Brigade to the Russian armed forces on the 14th of May. So these blue areas are positions that have been lost. As we know, that Wagner did hand over the flanks very recently to the more uh, regular Russian armed forces. And as Wagner continue their advance through this very centre of Bakhmut, we can see that the regular forces have lost some ground on the north and south flanks. And is this shaping up to be then for more of a major offensive here? Uh, is Ukrainian forces shaping this area there or is Russia in turn shaping it the other way? But I think that is enough mapping today and it gives us a good idea as what's happening. So the center, Russia is taking ground, but on the flanks, Ukraine is taking ground. But it is very all over the place as it is definitely a very fluid front line. Now, something that I haven't really seen spoken about that much is how Putin has signed a decree simplifying the citizenship process on May 15th, so yesterday, and this is for foreigners and stateless people wanting to fight in the Russian military or fighting in the Russian military. This becomes a pathway for Russian citizenship that will now be available for those who sign only a one-year contract or for military service. Now, interestingly, the spouses, children, and parents will also be eligible for this for the decree. The decree, which was signed by Putin on May 15th, has entered immediate effect. Now, there are plenty of foreigners who have signed up to fight for Russian forces, as well as Wagner Group, and this can definitely entice people. You know, for example, I've spoken at length about Western-trained Afghan soldiers who are being hunted by the Taliban looking to sign up for things like this. At the end of the day, you know, it's very easy for us to sit back and judge people and say, we would not do that. And of course, in our situation, of course, we would not do that. But there are people in situations that it could be a good out if you're being hunted down or my family will get citizenship. Even if I go to the front line and die, at least then my family gets citizenship. Would I trust the process? No, but could this open up for a lot of people? Absolutely. Now, this is definitely all in a move to not have the incredibly unpopular further mobilization of Russian citizens. And we've seen decrees and bills changed again and again. So last September, Putin signed a bill to make it easier for foreigners to obtain Russian citizenship through military service. Last November, Putin signed a decree allowing contract service in the Russian armed forces for persons with a foreign, foreign citizenship when it used to only be open for Russian citizens. And last May, Putin signed a decree that abolished the upper age limit for signing a contract with the Russian armed forces for both Russian citizens and foreigners. So there's definitely going to be people who sign up for this to get that citizenship. And, you know, us in the Western world are very biased one way. And you've got to remember that there's a whole other world out there who don't view things as favorably as maybe we do. Now, we've seen a huge explosion in Kamelsky since I've spoken to you guys last. Now, this is said to be caused by four Shahid drones, which have breached deep into Ukrainian territory and struck a facility. Now, this is geolocated to this red dot here and as you can see this is the russian federation around here and they've come in a long way so if we come in on this what exactly have they struck and then let's go onto the satellite map and this facility has been confirmed here, which is said to be an ammunition and fuel storage facility. Now, this is definitely not the first time that Russia has struck fire into Ukraine, but it does raise a lot of questions about air defense coverage. And we know it was here. And let's have a look at a few of the videos of this as well. So this is what we're looking at currently on the map. And if we go to then the after photo, this is now how it looks. So if we can get rid of this. This is the Google satellite image, and this is how it is looking now from other satellite photographs. And this was a massive explosion. So let's have a look at this. So here we see the first explosion raising up into a huge mushroom cloud. Every time I say mushroom cloud, I cop a lot of shit because people are saying that's only for nuclear weapons. Well, we're seeing it looking like a mushroom cloud. 
I'm going to call it that. And then we do see then a second strike and another large explosion kick off as well. So there is the second explosion. You can then see the shockwave travel out and then into a second major mushroom cloud from there. And this is zoomed out from this camera under it for a security camera there. We also have this video, which is a lot closer. Massive fireball raising up. I'm not unsure if this person got any uh, injuries from being this close, as, a, as you do know that things can burn you even within kilometers of a massively hot explosion like this. Raising up into this huge fireball and then into this huge hot mist from here, raising up. And then you can see the second explosion in the background from here. Interestingly, too, in this photograph, you can actually see that all the trees have just been just abolished away as well in this region. And this is very similar to the explosions in Pavlograd, which I did a video on recently, which was a fuel storage facility that was not dismantled as per the state obligations for disarming the ICBMs after the Soviet Union had fell. So if you notice that I magically changed clothes, I'm gonna use some bits and pieces from that video. So from all the reporting, it's being said that this was a weapon storage facility from 1949. And many have speculated that it was a storage facility or ammo dump for a number of more reasons recent weapons and people will throw the 500 million dollars out there of NATO West weapons but there is no evidence of this at all and unverified claims of depleted uranium storage there also but I haven't seen any evidence of this either this is some things from 2017 about this same uh, facility from a Ukrainian paper 10 kilometers from the ammunition is ready for a possible evacuation all of Ukraine is talking about the consequences of the explosion near Venezia Venezia is to the east of here few people know that near and I won't try and um, pronounce this as well there is a risk zone warehouses with aviation ammunition by the warehouses were aviation Aviation ammunition has been stored since 1949. Uh, this is a regime object that is constantly under guard, and this is what has been hit here as well. How much ammunition is in the warehouse? Sorry about the ads. Uh, an A3013 military unit to which they belong also said the warehouses with ammunition are a threat. Warehouses as regular military facility are listed on the balance sheet of Ministry of Defense of Ukraine. There are rumors that they wanted to downsize and take them out, but because of the war in the east, the process was suspended. Almost 5,000 people at risk, especially in the affected area. In total, 5,000 residents are at risk. Uh, fragments can fly up to five kilometers and a damage radius of 1,000 meters. And this is looking like what was hit. Now, people are saying that from the explosion, it doesn't seem to align with that of an ammunition explosion due to the lack of what they call fireworks, which are, you see, they look like fireworks as the ammunition then cooks off. And it looks more in line with an explosion of one of fuel. But I'm not an expert on explosions at all. Now, in my research for this, and this is well out of date, but I thought was interesting, I actually came across this declassified CIA document that you can actually get from the Freedom of Information Act, and I'll link that down below. But again, of course, this is out of date, but from uh, the Americans when there was the USSR. So this is the ammunition dep depot here from the USSR top secret that was from 1964 and released then on 2003 and there are some interesting bits on this offense explosive storage is like at 10 kilometers northwest of the center of the city rain line a uh, two to four lane road and they go over this full installation of the storage areas here the area contains six 190 by 65 foot buildings three 100 by 65 foot buildings three 105 by 65 foot bunkers 13 buildings ranging from 105 to 35 feet and nine buildings in the open are heavily revetted and these very old photographs here maybe from like a u2 spy plane or something and this photograph here of course this is on a different angle you just need to turn it slightly but it is interesting just to find old bits and pieces like this so just for reference this is the twin road through here that splits off with the railway coming through and you can see these buildings down here that snake as well through as well. So it's a very interesting uh, piece that I found while I was just looking into this. I'm sure if that interests anyone else. But from the geolocation, we know that this is now the most likely position that I'm seeing shared amongst multiple people geolocating certain things. And what is here is the chemical plant. Let's have a look at some of this explosion. And this is an extremely large explosion here. It looks like a nuclear weapon has gone off. And from here, 
we can see that then the shockwave hits. An incredible heat. So you see it rising up in the sky here, and then, and you can hear, and it looks honestly like a nuclear weapon that hit. You can see things flying out from all directions in this region, and then the subsequent burning. In the Pavlograd region, it is well known that there is stored solid rocket fuel from Ukraine's forfeited, dismantled intercontinental ballistic missiles and storage of other rocket fuel and also making new weapons in these chemical plants. Also, apparently here, according to the international campaign to ban landmines, the ICBL, the facility is also being used to store stockpiled anti-personnel landmines designated for destruction under the Moan Ban Treaty. Now, Obviously, this is a super high priority target for Russia. And so these are a couple articles from years ago and some footage about this facility. So what we're going to look at here is some articles. So let's first start with the Pavlograd mines. And I have some little bits and pieces highlighted here. So the structure of 55 million mile, uh, 55 million stockpiled personal mines under the Mine Ban Treaty is one of the effects of this ICBL. Uh, only two of the mine ban treaties, 164 state parties, have stockpiled interpersonal mines left to destroy. So these two are, are the stockpile deadlines for Greece and Ukraine's deadline of 2010. In Ukraine, we regret that it has no uh, there has been no stockpile destruction since 2020. And at the end of the agreement between Ukraine's Ministry of Defense and NATO's support and procurement agency to destroy the remaining stockpile mines at the Pavlograd chemical plant from the BBC before this war. So this is January 24th, 2020. If there is an explosion, it could be the end. This is speaking of chemical plant in the Dnipro region, which is at Pavlograd. So situation around the facility where the rocket fuel is stored. Turns out state stopped financing the program for its disposal. 1.8 thousand tons of expired rocket fuel are stored on the territory of the Pavlograd chemical plant. It has been 20 years since the expiration date. Speaking of these consequences, if Ukraine is not going to fulfill its international obligations, it should make appropriate statements, said the General Director of the Enterprise. Reasons for the suspension of the program. So the agency submitted the proposal to the government in which they indicated their required amount, which is 800 million rivners, which I believe is about $22 million. In the budget for this year, almost 31 million rivners were provided, which is not enough for the safe storage of rocket housings with fuel. Again, that'll be linked down below if you're interested in reading over that full document. And there's lots available on the Freedom of Information side of the CIA website. Now, recently the UK has supplied Ukraine maybe the worst named weapon ever, the Storm Shadow cruise missile, which has greatly extended Ukraine's strike range to said to be 250 kilometers. You have to excuse the incredibly lame name. I, I hope it's just off someone's like kid named that. These are an incredibly deadly versatile weapon and do pose a huge threat to Russia. Now, so Russian sources are claiming this fragment was found from a storm shadow in Luhansk, and this would be the first use of one against Russian forces. So this uh, this is the video of what we have seen here. These fragments here, like a tail fin with this danger on it here being shown, and they're saying it is from this part, this tail fin area here. Again, this is very hard to talk against as well, as we saw with the uh, Kiev mayor with the alleged Kinzhal missile as well. And this is said to be the smoke rose up in Luhansk from where that storm shadow hit. Now, the Russian MOD has also claimed to have successfully downed one storm shadow in yesterday's statement. The defense systems intercepted seven harm anti-radar missiles, one storm shadow long-range cruise missile, and 10 HIMARS, multiple rocket launches during the day. Again, take this all with a grain of salt. Russian sources are also claiming that they have shown before that they can intercept these missiles, saying Russian missile systems proved in Syria that they can destroy the Storm Shadow missiles. Our missile systems were first faced with them during an attack on Damascus on April 14th, 2018. Those missiles were down then. Technology that the missile is based on is called Fire and Forget. It follows the route and is laid out for it. The route cannot be changed, nor can the missile be programmed to self-destruct. It reaches a target and hits it. However, our book or tour systems 
deployed in Syria, detected and downed it. I am unable to verify any of this, but the British MOD and American MOD would know if this was correct or not. These do increase Ukraine's range significantly, with these maps floating around from the usual bloody blue check mark accounts on Twitter. And this is 250 kilometers out. Of course, these won't be fired from the, directly on the border, but these are being shared around a lot. But again, these missiles can only be used on Russian positions in Ukrainian territory, not against this ter the territory of Belarus or the Russian territory around here. We all know no air defense system has complete coverage, and most systems were developed before the wide access to cheap drones that can overwhelm these systems, then this has been causing a huge headache. President Zelensky is on tour around Europe and has met yesterday with the UK's Rishi Sunak. Now Zelensky has again spoken of the importance of fighter aircraft, saying it's a very important topic for us because we can't control the sky, with the BBC reporting that the Prime Minister said providing fighter jets was not a straightforward thing, although he did say the UK would form a key part of the coalition countries providing that support. Now French President Macron was also asked about fighter jets and he has said we have opened the door to training pilots and this with several other European countries who are also ready. I think the discussions are underway with the Americans. We've spoken in length about issues with fighter aircraft. We know that modern fighters from the West will not be taking place in the upcoming Ukrainian counter-offensive. Now, in a meeting with German Chancellor of Schools, vowed to back Ukraine for as long as it is necessary. Now, he has promised another 2.7 billion euros worth of weapons. There to be 30 Leopard 1A5 tanks, 20 Marta armored personnel carriers, more than 100 combat vehicles, 18 self-propelled howitzers, 200 reconnaissance drone, 4 RST SLM anti-aircraft systems, and a range of other air defense equipment. As we know, air defense is one of the things that Ukraine need most desperately currently. Zelensky from there has then flown to Italy, escorted by German fighter aircraft, to meet with the Italian President Sergio Mattarella, and the Prime Minister He's also had a private meeting with Pope Francis at the Vatican. But legends for me, that's it for today. Um, and my tumor is slowly killing me, so I hope I can actually make it to the start of this counteroffensive, as it seemed like it's been a really long time. But to be honest, I actually believe that the offensive is already in the beginning stages and has actually started. But these front bits are just shaping the front line for the ideal position for large mechanized uh, maneuver warfare. But legends, I hope you have a great day. If you'd like to support me, links down below. But never feel obliged. So I'll speak to you tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. Bye bye.